I don't know about you, but I think those are some very perplexing questions this yes, evening. Sir. Yes, sir. How is it that we walk away from Him with everything that He's done for us? How is it that we get cold on Him and we have learned what it is to have His grace in our life and we are products of the grace of God? How is it that our heart grows cold after everything that Jesus did for us? Right. Amen. Man, what a great thought. Amen. Amen. I'd keep my finger on that song if I was you. I don't... And it can come to times like this and, and wonder what the Lord wants us to do. I do know that there was one songwriter that said, <clears throat> prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Yes, sir. And uh, we know what happened with that man's life. He was prone to wonder and he did walk away from God. And I do thank God that by the end of, life, at the end of his life, he did come back. But he found out the true validity of those words that he spoke and wrote down in that song is each and every one of us is prone to wonder. Uh, but I think also with the song that uh, Miss Tory just sang, that uh, you think that you, you spend your life meditating on what God did. I promise you'll probably uh, spend less time wondering and you'll spend a lot more time on your face. Amen. Amen. Right? And uh, thanking God for what He's done. Amen. Amen. I don't Amen. know how we can walk away from a God that has done so much for us, but we do. And he's not deserving of it, amen? Right. Uh, he doesn't deserve for us to walk away, but he, amen. I'm glad he's a lot better than we are, amen? amen. I'm amen. glad that he amen. has long-suffering and he's merciful and he's gracious, amen? Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Go with me, please, to the book of Exodus tonight. Exodus chapter number two, amen. And uh, we will look, uh, continue to look at the thought that we began this morning and uh, got just one aspect, one attribute of this text uh, uh, preached to you this morning and so we'll look at some others Exodus chapter number 2 and uh, when you find your place there I'll invite you to stand and reverence the reading of the word of God uh, we took our text beginning this morning in Hebrews chapter number 11 and we mentioned about this characteristic about Moses how the very introductory words of Moses is mentioned in the Hall of Fame of Faith in Hebrews 11 was that he, when he was born, he was hid three months of his parents because they saw that he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. This morning we, uh, we left from this passage and began to look in Exodus chapter number 2 about the account of what is being recalled by the Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter number 11. And uh, we find, found out that Moses did not become the deliverer of the children of Israel. He did not become the great lawgiver. Uh, he did not become one of the greatest types of a pastor in the Old Testament. He did not become that leader uh, that uh, was able to see Red Sea crossings and great miracles uh, that he was able to see uh, on his own. He became the man not on his own faith, because his story started way before he was able to exhibit faith. But he came in to the destiny that God had for his life on the faith of his parents. In particular, we'll find out in Exodus chapter number 2, the faith of his mom. Look with me at Exodus chapter number 2, and we'll begin reading in verse number 1. The Bible says, well actually let's look at uh, chapter number 1, and let's go back to uh, verse, number, verse number 16. The Bible says, and he said, this is the Pharaoh speaking, uh, called in verse, six, uh, verse 15, the king of Egypt. Verse 16 says, and he said, when you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then ye shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not, as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men, children, alive. And I would say amen to that right there. Amen. Yes, Thank God for mamas being mamas and ladies being ladies. Not going to let those young babies be slaughtered. Amen. Verse 18 says, And the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said unto them, Why have ye done this thing and have saved the men, children, alive? And the midwives said unto Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, 
For they are lively and are delivered ere the midwives come in unto them. Therefore God dealt well with the midwives and the people multiplied and waxed very mightily. And it came to pass because the midwives feared God that he made them houses. And Pharaoh charged all his people saying every son that is born ye shall cast into the river and every daughter ye shall save alive. Chapter number 2 and verse number 1. And there went a man of the house of Levi and took to wife a daughter of Levi. That's as far as we got this morning. Verse number 2. The Bible says, And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. And when she could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein. And she laid it in the flags by the river's uh, brink. And his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river, and her maidens walked along uh, by the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him, and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then said she to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. And the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses, and she said, Because I drew him out of the water. You may be seated. Let's bow for a word of prayer together, and we will get in to the thought for this evening. Let's pray. Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we bow in your presence once again, as thankfully and humbly as we know how. Thanking you, Lord, for another day. Thanking you, Lord, for another opportunity that we have to come into the house of God. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege that we have, Lord, to know that we're saved by the grace of God. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege that we have to know that grace, Lord, has been uh, contributed to our life. That grace is something that we are familiar with. Grace is something that uh, we uh, do not understand everything of. But, Lord, we are partakers of your grace. And Lord God, even though we don't understand how you could give us grace, Lord God, we're so thankful that you gave us grace and you gave us mercy. Lord God, that we can sing the songs tonight and know that it is well with our soul and know that we, uh, Lord, if our heart were to stop and we were to die, that heaven would be our home. And Lord God, we're so thankful for the privilege to be your family. Lord God, to be in your house and to hear from your word. And Lord God, I pray that you would help me as I preach the word of God. Lord, we are in a wonderful place. We are with a wonderful people. Lord God, we are opening up, opening up a supernatural book and anything that is said out of it is supernatural. And Lord God, I pray that you'd help me not to mess it up in the natural. Lord, I pray, dear God, that you'd help me, Lord, uh, to preach what you would say. Lord God, not to take something as high and holy as delivering your word to your people. And Lord God, let myself get in the way. Lord, I pray that you would hide me in Christ, in God, according to Colossians chapter number 3. In verse number 3, I pray, dear God, that these people would not see me. But Lord, I pray, God, that they would see you and they would see you high and lifted up. Lord God, you would be their premier focus because your word said that if you would be lifted up, you would draw all men unto yourself. And Lord, I pray that that is the business that you would do tonight. Lord God, if there's a sinner here that has never been saved, I pray, God, that you'd bring them to yourself. Lord God, I pray that as, as real as, as if you were physically standing in front of their eyes tonight, Lord, I pray, God, that you would help them to see the scars in your hands. Lord, I pray that you would help them to see the scars in your feet. Lord, I pray, God, that you'd help them to see the uh, see the uh, the wound in your side where the spear was driven. 
Lord, I pray, dear God, that you'd help them to see the love that was displayed on Calvary. Lord, I pray, God, that you'd help them to see your love for them and the free pardon of sin that exists at the foot of the cross. Lord, I pray, dear God, that you would help that backslider tonight to realize that your grace Lord, it's enough for us to never wander. Lord God, taking a trip down memory's lane and thinking about and meditating upon your goodness and your grace should cause us to desire to be as close as we can be. Father, I pray that you'd help any and all tonight that's not where they need to be. Lord God, tonight to get their heart right and to get their life settled in your fellowship tonight, close and Lord, diligently serving you. Father, I pray for your people, God, that you'd feed them and instruct them and help them as only you can. Meet every need. Speak to each and every heart according to the need. Father, I pray, dear Lord, that you would use my lips of clay and help me to do something that is eternally effective. Lord, I pray, dear God, that you would do an eternal business in this place. Lord God, that you do a supernatural work. I pray, God, that my words would not be my words, but they would be your words. Father, I pray, dear God, that you would, uh, Lord, that you would uh, keep me from saying anything, prevent me from saying anything, that you would not have to be said and enable me to be able to say those things that you would have to be said, embolden me to say the things, Lord, that in my flesh it may be uncomfortable to say, but it may be needful for this congregation. Father, I pray that you'd help me to rightly divide the word of truth. Lord God, to do right by the word of God and to do right by this people. Father, I pray that you'd illuminate my mind to the things that we stand in need of for tonight. Give me discernment to know which way to go as far as this time of, uh, of preaching and delivering your word. Lord, we don't want anything out of your will. Lord, we want to look to you and have you speak to our hearts. Help this congregation as they listen. Help us, God, to be attentive to listen not to my voice, but to your voice and to your message for them tonight. Lord God, I pray that your will would be done. Speak to our hearts accordingly. Lord, I pray that you'd send an old-fashioned sin-killing devil chasing revival to the Beacon Baptist Church tonight. Have your will and way. And God will thank you, Lord, for what you do. In the blessed, wonderful, glorious, majestic name that is above every name, the name of our blessed, blood-stained Redeemer, we pray. Amen and amen. Here in Exodus chapter number 2, we concluded our service this morning here in this great passage of Scripture, this account of what the writer of the book of Hebrews was referring back to when he wrote the words that he wrote in Hebrews chapter number 11 and verse number 23 through 29 about the life of Moses in particular, that faith that, he, that Moses' parents had to exhibit uh, on the, uh, at his birth in order to secure his life and to protect him. We see in this text that there has been a decree that has went out from uh, the Pharaoh that all male children are to be killed. They are to be slaughtered. Verse 16 says, And when you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then ye shall kill him. He told those midwives, you are to personally take hand in killing these children. Now you and I may not truly understand the heart uh, that could be behind this. And the Bible does not necessarily explain to us why, uh, the, why the Pharaoh decided to do that. But when we come to the Scriptures, we find out this Pharaoh, had all, as the king of Egypt, had all of the authority. He was, he was the sole leader of this nation. And what he said went. And when he said, you do this, everyone else was supposed to do it. And if they didn't, then there could be severe, maybe even fatal consequences for not following this leader. And so we saw how, uh, how Jochebed, which the Scriptures later give us her name, this mother of Moses was used to secure the life, protect the baby, and preserve Moses uh, to be able to grow into an adult. And for at then for God at the age of 80 years old uh, to be able to call him to the ministry, call him to be the leader of the children of Israel, which he did and which he did faithfully from age 80 till he went to heaven at age 120. And so we began to look at this morning how Moses and the testimony of Moses' life greatly hinged upon the faith of his mother and his father. And so we began to look at four key attributes that Jochebed, Moses' mother, possessed that every Christian mother needs to be the mom that raises a faith-filled child that serves the Lord like Moses. 
This morning, the first thing that we brought out was about how Exodus chapter number 2 and verse number 1 mentions that Jochebed was a daughter of Levi, was a daughter a descendant of this tribe that would later on become the servants in the temple, the servants of the house of God. And we saw that this, this phrase, a daughter of Levi, represents to us that she was a lady that knew the Lord. Uh, she was a lady that had been saved. She was saved, she was sold out, and we believe that she was someone that had a heart to serve the Lord based on this phrase. And so we looked at how the best gift that any mom can give to their children is to influence their children and pass along their faith in their children. And by the way, I know it's Mother's Day and I'm preaching to moms, but dads, guess what? You are to be leading your house, leading your home, leading your wife even, in instilling those values, instilling that doctrine, instilling that faith in your children. Amen. And I know we read some accounts of different men in history that talked about their moms and how their moms would instruct them in the scriptures and read around the table. I believe it was Spurgeon that said that his mom every night would read the scriptures around the table and would read verse by verse and explain to them the scriptures and then plead with God on their behalf. And I do thank God for mothers that will do that. I thank God for uh, that those testimonies and how they stirred our heart. But Dad, if you're not leading in that, don't expect your wife to be that kind of mom. That's right. Amen. Amen. Yes, sir. Don't look at your wife this week after I get done preaching these messages and say, man, you can really step it up in, 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 the, in the motherhood side of your life and can try to be comparable to Spurgeon's mom or comparable to uh, John Newton's mom or one of these that we mentioned this morning, Samuel's mom. Hannah or John the Baptist, Mom Elizabeth, or, or what have you. Don't, don't you be looking at your wife and saying you need to step your game up as far as uh, being the mom that she needs to be until you're willing to be the authority in your home, willing to be the leader in your home. By the way, the best way she's going to be able uh, to step that proverbial game up, if you can call it that, is if she has a godly husband that lives it in front of her every single day and shows her what walking with God looks like, shows her what Bible reading and Bible study looks looks like, shows her what prayer looks like. Amen goes right there. Amen. Amen. So the first thing we saw is that uh, Moses needed his mom and he needed his mother to be a mother whose credentials were right. She was saved. She was a daughter of Levi. Tonight, let me submit this to you, number two. Not only did Moses need his mom to have the right credentials for her credentials to be right, but he also needed his mom to have a courage that was right. To have a courage that was right. Did you know that moms are called upon to be some of the most courageous people that exist in this world? Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. I don't know how anybody can enter into that role without some kind of courage. Right. Amen. Amen. I mean, you think you think about having a child, and I understand what it, what it takes to have a child physically. And I know we have, we live in a world where a lot of people know uh, know how to produce children, but they don't care to raise any. I understand that. Uh, but as far as entering into and choosing that you're going to raise your child, and especially as a Christian mom, there there's a lot of courage that it's going to take uh, to be the mom, to be the parent that you need to be for those children, because when it comes to parenthood, guess what you're doing? You're walking out in the dark. Right. Right. You may have had good parents, but you've never had. That child has never existed before. Yeah, right. And I live every single, life, every single day of my life realizing that ch a child like mine has never quite existed before. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And so it's all on the job training. Amen. Amen. And you have unique children, and God equipped you to be the parent for those unique children. And uh, so therefore it takes some courage because with it being on the job training, you're walking out into a world that has never existed before because nobody other than you has ever parented a child just like yours and you are shaping and molding a life that will eventually, and I know the world looks at it and say, well, you're, you're shaping a life to either be successful or to be a failure. I'd say it'd be more than that. You are shaping children that will definitely enter into eternity one. I saw a, I saw a uh, quote talking, and, and, and uh, it, it said, uh, it said talking about children or talking about parents and 
Parents always investing in their children, trying to get them to be uh, on the sports team and trying to really pump sports in them with a hope that they might one day grow up to be the greatest basketball player or the greatest soccer player or, or whatever the sport may be. And uh, it gave a percentage, and it was a very, very small percentage, and it, it was literally less than 1%, a, a fraction of 1%, it said that is the chances that you have of your child uh, being a, an athlete. However, it's a 100% chance that your child will meet Jesus. Amen. That's right. 100% chance that your child is going to have to stand before God. Right. They may never be. The, and chances are they probably won't be the, the star athlete or the, or the star uh, pupil in their school or in their college. But there is a hundred percent certainty that the children that we are in that we are entrusting truth to and lessons to and investing in every single day, there's a hundred percent chance that they will have to stand and give an account eyeball to eyeball with Jesus Christ in their Amen. life in these days. Yes, sir. You know what you're doing as a parent? You are choosing. And I know it's all about the decision your child makes. But if you, if you don't live it in front of them, how in the world do you think they have a thimbles full of a hope to ever be on the right side of Calvary? Amen. Yes. Amen. You know what you're doing when you're raising your children? They will all stand before Jesus one day. That is a 100% fact. With your parenting as a godly parent, you are choosing whether or not they're going to stand before Jesus at, at the judgment seat of Christ or whether you're, they're going to stand and give an account to Jesus at the great white throne judgment. Amen. Right. Right. Amen. Amen. If you cease to be the godly parent that you need to be, chances are, unless God just miraculously, miraculously intervenes, and I praise God for when He does, and when God brings a godly friend into somebody's life, or God brings a godly family into somebody's life, or somebody like myself gets saved at a vacation Bible school, and I went there, heard the gospel, and God changed my life and changed the direction of my life from the life that the rest of my relatives had known. I'm thankful when things like that happen. But as the norm, your children are going to go in the direction that you have led them to go in. They will follow your footsteps there. Amen. If you are headed uh, to the judgment seat of Christ as a Christian, then they will, uh, they will follow you there. Chances are, if you keep the gospel in front of them, and chances are you're giving them a better chance to follow you there. If you're a half-hearted Christian, chances are they're going to stand before Jesus, probably get about the same amount of rewards for Christ. Even as a believer that you may get. Mm -hmm. right. Amen. Mm -hmm. If you're not concerned about the things of God, chances are you'll never be able to get that in your kids. Right. And unless God does something apart from what you're teaching your children, right. it could be very devastating for them. The credentials were right, but the courage was right. She was willing to do something that had never been done. Look at verse number 2. Verse 2 tells us that she had the courage to hide him three months. The Bible says in verse number 2, And the woman conceived and bare a son. So at that very moment, she knows she's going to have to do something. That's right. There's going to have to be courage exhibited. Amen. Because the very moment she saw Moses and she saw that he was a boy rather than a girl, she knew that the government had declared a death sentence upon this child. Right. I believe personally with all of my heart the reason why God gave that lady a son is because He knew that He could trust her to do the right thing when He gave her a son. Amen. 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 If she, if, if I believe with all my heart, if God knew that she was just going to throw that child in the river, God probably would have given her a daughter. No, I never made her face it. Yeah. But she, He knew that he could trust Jacob Edward the son. Why? Because this lady was a lady of great courage. Yes. The Bible says she saw that son. She bare a son. And when she saw him, that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. Do you know the courage that it would take to at that moment knowing what has been declared from Pharaoh? And by the way, this is not like we would experience in our nation this man had all the power. These men were willing to die for him. There were, pe there were people in these Pharaoh's lives that would kill themselves just to attend with their future. They, they believed in afterlife. They were believed in, in taking things with them into eternity. His servants would even kill themselves so that they could go with their Pharaohs to eternity. 
That's what they believed. These were, these were men of great authority and great power. And what they said was final. Can you imagine the dauntless courage that it would take for her to know what the king had just commanded and still hide her child? Knowing that one day she's going to have to face the decision, what am I going to do? I may be able to hide him now. I may be able to be. I may be able to keep him secret. I may be able to keep him kind of covertly hidden for now. But there's going to be a day, and our text tells us that there was a day where she was faced with the ultimate decision that a mom could ever have to face. I'm telling you, I look. I look up to Jochebed here. Amen. Man, what faith! No wonder that she and her husband were recorded in God's hall of fame and said, by faith, Moses, he was hid three months of his parents because of their faith. Amen. They're mentioned there. Notice this, she had courage despite the Pharaoh's decree. Chapter number 1, verse number 16, chapter number 1 and verse number 22, the Pharaoh charged all the people saying that every son that is born you shall kill, that's verse 16, or you shall cast into the river, that's verse 22. She stood up in the face of a godless pagan environment and refused to do what everyone else was doing. And by the way, that has not changed all the way to 2019. You know what it, you know what it takes courage to do? To do something nobody else is doing. Amen. To stand up when be, it's to be willing to stand by yourself when nobody else is standing, when nobody else is doing what you're doing, when nobody else is living for God the way you are. It takes great courage to be willing to walk out all by yourself just to stand for the Lord. Amen. She said that she loved her baby too much and to give in to society. She loved Amen. Moses too much to give in to the world. The political Amen. leadership of her day commanded for mothers to personally cast their children into the water and to cause them to drown and to take part in releasing them uh, to the unimaginable. But Jochebed refused and praised the Lord for someone that is willing to stand up, that is willing to stand out, and willing to be counted as someone who is on the Lord's side. Amen. and not on the world's Amen. side. Right. Amen. You would think that such a vile act uh, as we find recorded in this text would have been something that would have been protested. You know, we find, we find in our world people having all kinds of protests about an animal uh, being treated inhumanely. And by the way, I do believe that any righteous man will regard the life of their beast. I do believe you'll take care of it. But I believe that it is it is a sad, sad day when we could we could take part in uh, in a protest for an animal uh, being injured in some way or being treated in in, in some way or you making a coat out of a certain kind of animal or whatever. And uh, but we have no we have no concern and there's no protest for human life. Being right. taken. Right. Amen. Right. I believe that when we think about this act, you and I as people who are saved and have, uh, have a spiritual mind and know right from wrong according to the doctrines of the Scripture and the laws of God, we would think that somebody should have stood up and said something about this. Somebody should have erected an army and should have tried to overthrow such a violent, cruel regime. But rather what we find is a whole nation full of people that are bowing down uh, to those that are in control. And instead of standing for what was right, they just gave in because it was comfortable. You know what we call that? Cowardice. Amen. Jochebed was courageous rather than cowardice. Today we would think that something as vile as this should uh, be on all of the major news stations and there ought to be someone standing out front begging for the people of the world to stop the injustice and our world uh, and stop that injustice but our world today is still expecting the same animals. Mm -hmm. Amen. And we don't hear the cries of people saying stop the injustice. We hear people cry about what they, the so-called racial relations in this world we, and, and if that's going on, that is an injustice. Amen. That's right. We had we had an African American lady in service with us this morning, and uh, I, I had somebody mention to me that they were asked, "Well, would it, would it be okay if we bring her because of her ethnicity?" And uh, that member was able to say, "Absolutely." Yes. Amen. Yes, 
That's the way church ought to be. Amen. Amen. Jesus didn't die for souls. He didn't die for skin. Amen. Right. Right. The same gospel that saved you and I is the same gospel that can work mightily in that young lady's life. And I pray that it does. I, I look forward maybe to seeing them on Sunday. Amen. Yeah. And I, I thank God, by the way, let me just say this. I thank God to be part of a church where we can say that. Sinners of all kinds, people of all kinds can come in here and find a church that's going to love on them and love on them and point them to Jesus and welcome them. Amen. And by the way, if she gets saved here, uh, if she does get saved by the grace of God, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to shake that young lady's hand and say, welcome to the family of God. Amen. By the way, there, there is no schisms in the family of God. Amen. Amen. The Bible says the Lord, the Lord's going to present to Himself uh, those from all tribes and kindreds and tongues and nations. Amen. Amen. By the way, all of the all of sal salvation reaching to all creeds, all colors, all ethnicities, and all religious backgrounds. You know what that does? That is a testimony to the great, the great power, great grace of, of our Lord. Amen. Amen. That He can reach to all of the ends of the earth with the same gospel. Amen. 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 We would think that we we hear all the time about all of the injustices in the world, but when our world today asks us to do the same thing, asks us to put our stamp of approval on the same thing, ask our churches to be okay with the same thing happening with our government that was happening in Pharaoh's government, they expect us not to say anything. Where, where are the Christians at? Where are the Christians that are saying, stop this evil? Yes. Stop this injustice? Lord, where yeah. are the believers that are saying, this has to stop? This is not God. And I'm amazed at how many churches are being so silent about things like this. Amen. Yeah. And I'm determined, and I know this may get us hate mail, I know it's going online, but get the Bible says what it says and means what it says, yeah. when it says what it does, and murder is still wrong, yeah. especially yeah. when it involves the innocent life of new Amen. 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 Of infants, whether in the womb or not, by the way, from the very, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but I'm just going to say this just because I want to let you and everybody else that may ever listen to this to know where we stand in this church, and that is that life begins at conception. Yes. Amen. 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 Our world's cry today is abortion and population control. Yes. That's the world's cry today. Yes, it is. Right. We, have, we have people even in our own House of Representatives that say, like China has in years gone by, that we need to limit the number of children that, uh, that a family can have because the world is getting too populated. That's right. That's hogwash. Right. Amen. Right. Amen. Right. Amen. Yeah. Their cry is abortion and population control. Uh, AO, uh, AOC, that uh, 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 representative in Congress, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, she says that uh, mothers need to stop having children. China says you have one apiece. That's right. She says have none because it is, it is in contributing to the destruction of the world and global warming and things like that. By the way, all of that is a fairy tale right. created uh, by, by the liberal. Right. Amen. Right. Amen. Right. Amen. There's not a shred, a, uh, there's not a, there's not a, a, a shred of, uh, of scientific evidence for any right. of that. Amen. Amen. Right. That's not just something our president that's saying. That's what the world and the, and, and the, and the planet today, that is what it is declared. All of that's hogwash. Amen. Right. Amen. They are asking for us to throw away our children's lives in an act of obedience to the governmental powers that be. All over this country and around the world, there are women who could have been and truthfully should be celebrating Mother's Day like the rest of you ladies in here that God has given the precious gift of life uh, that are gathered in this church today. While they should be because they had a baby, they conceived a baby and it was put in their life for a reason, they should be celebrating Mother's Day instead the best that they can look at this day and celebrate. And I know they call it a woman's right to choose, but they have turned Mother's Day into Murderer's Day. Amen. Because it's not a choice. 
It's not, it's not a choice to, uh, of your body. It's not a medical decision. It is, it is cold-blooded murder. Right. It is nothing more than those midwives taking those children yes. of the Hebrew women, yes. walking them down to the banks of the Nile River and throwing them into the water. We just have gotten a little bit more sophisticated over the centuries. We have gotten to where we put a doctor's signature on it. We have gotten to where we have medical devices that do it. We've gotten to where we use four sets instead of uh, crocodiles to do it. We have gotten to where uh, we use medicine and we use injections rather than the rapid wa waves of the uh, Nile River. But it is still the same. It is still the same declaration from the government. It is still the same death for the child. It is still the same wickedness. And God declares that He is against it. Amen. Amen. Our children are being murdered in cold blood at the hands of men and women who are supposed to be healers. Right. But they're not. Right. Amen. Right. You may ask why I bring up such a subject on Mother's Day. And the reason why I do is because there uh, is a there is a design from God to motherhood that's found in Titus chapter number 2. And that is that mothers are to love their children, not to have them torn limb from limb. Amen. Can I remind you one of the main reasons why I'm going to mention this every time I get a chance in the pulpit here? It, it, it would, by the way, it's an act of obedience to Scripture. You say, why would you preach on it any time? It even smells like an opportunity uh, to cry out against it. Because Proverbs 31 8 says, Open thy mouth for the dumb. In other words, those who cannot speak for themselves. Open thy mouth. For the dumb, in the case of all such as are appointed to destruction. And the, the laws that our nation has passed has appointed many uh, innocent lives, many uh, infants to destruction. And God says when they cannot speak for themselves, they need to have somebody that knows me that won't keep their mouth closed but will rather open up against it and say this is what God says and this is right and this is true. And anything outside of that is an abomination in the eyes of God. And it's sin against the thrice holy God. Amen. 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 Proverbs 6 16 says, These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him a proud look, a lying tongue, and the third of the seven is an hands that shed innocent blood. Amen. The Bible says, These things are things that God hates. And it goes on to say that it is an, it is an abomination in the eyes of a holy God. Jochebed was protecting her son by the actions that she took on behalf of one who could not take action for himself. Moses could not protect himself here. There was many times where Moses would encounter a battlefield. He would have chilled the children of Israel. Joshua leading them into battle. And in that moment, yes, he may have been an elderly man, but there could have been something that he could have done. A lot of times what Moses would do is retreat to pray and ask for God to bless the men that were on the battlefield fighting. But at least in that moment, there was something that Moses could do. But here in this moment, just three months from his birth, there was nothing that Moses could do for himself. And therefore, it took a courageous mama who loved her baby more than life to stand between destruction and her child and say, that's not what I'm going to allow. I'm going to do everything I can, even if it means my life Amen. being destroyed. Amen. That takes Amen. us to our next thought. Amen. Not only did she have courage despite the Pharaoh's decree, but she had courage despite a potential destruction. Notice what the Bible says again in verse number 3. The Bible says, and when she could no longer hide him. Word's going to get out some way or another. Uh, is there any mamas in here that can testify to the fact you can't keep them babies little forever? Amen. It don't take long for them to get a little too big or a little too loud for you to be able to hide them away. Amen. The Bible said when she could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein. She laid it in the flags by the river's brink. She knew that there was only one way that she was going to be able to preserve him. That was for her to rebel 
And by the way, I don't think that there is anything wrong with rebelling against wickedness, Amen. even if it does come from the government. Amen. If there is, if I believe that the Christian ought to be the most ideal, obedient yes. citizen in the United States of America. I do believe that the, that the government should have no issues out of the Christians. By the way, if you are a child of God, pay your taxes. Amen. 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 Jesus did say, render unto Caesar, the representative of the government, the things that are Caesar's, and unto God, the things that are God's. He says two things that a Christian ought to be paying. Christians ought to be paying their taxes and ought to be paying their tithes. Amen. Right there. Amen. Give Caesar what belongs to him. Give to God Amen. what belongs to him. You pay your taxes and your tithes. Amen. You're doing what God wants you to do with your money. Amen. 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 But so when we think about these about what a citizen ought to be, what a, what, a, what a Christian ought to be in a government. I believe we ought to be obedient. But there is a time where if a government tells you that you're going to have to sin against God and walk away from the Scriptures in order to be obedient to them, then I believe we have a greater authority. I believe we have a king that is out of this world, that is beyond this world, that has a greater authority than any other uh, any other leader that has been established. I thank God for the President of the United States of America. I encourage each, encourage each and every one of you to pray every day for President Trump, to pray every day for Vice President Pence, to pray every day for our senators and our representatives here, uh, uh, here in this area and also around this country. We ought to be that level of obedient citizens and pray for them. And I thank God for the president that we have. And I believe the president that we have is an act of the grace of God. Oh, yeah. God's people got to pray and God sent an answer of someone that would stand for godly principles. He may not know a whole lot about God, but he's got people around him that can put him in the right direction and be favorable yes, to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and be a good big sister to Israel. Amen. There's never been a president according to Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister of the nation of Israel. He said recently about uh, on, on, uh, about our president. He said there's never been another president in the history of our nation that has been a greater friend to the nation of Israel. Amen. I thank God for that. But if, pre if President Amen. Trump said tomorrow we're walking away from God, we, we, are, we are walking away from the Bible, we're walking away from the truths of the Word of God, we're no longer standing with Israel, we're no longer, and he says you've got to do this and you've got to do that. Like this, this leader here, Pharaoh, was saying you've got to murder your children in order to be right with and being good with the government. Guess what? God's law stands high than man's laws. There's not another law that has ever been passed in our Congress or signed by any president from Washington to Trump today. There's never been a law that's ever been signed by our president that reaches as high as God's law. That is forever settled in heaven and it will always, always have, uh, have its authority on the earth. Amen. Amen. So you go with God against the world. Yeah. You obey the government when they, when they allow you to Live, the Bible says as much as lies within you, live peaceably with all men. I believe that includes the government, but there's a time where it doesn't lie within us to do so right. because it conflicts the law of God that He has written upon our heart. Amen. Disobedience for Jochebed, knowing that it was right, knowing what she had to do, that uh, uh, disobedience could mean death for her. But obedience, think about this, uh, disobedience, imagine, imagine the situation she has to be in. Disobedience means death for her. But obedience means death for her son. Right. Disobedience meant her death. Obedience, obedience meant her son's death. Can I say that in this text, the king had already issued a command in Exodus 1.16. He issued it again in Exodus 1.22. That meant that, that meant that when Jochebed disobeyed this disobeyed that command, she disobeyed a command that the king had chosen to give him twice, to be given twice. She was obeying not just against one declaration, but two declarations of the king. But because she knew disobedience meant death for her, and obedience meant death for her son, she chose to be disobedient against a godless government. And I believe that here in this text we find a true example of motherhood. Amen. 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 There's not a mom, there's not a godly parent in this room, whether mom or dad. I don't believe there's a grandparent in this room that if you had the choice, death of you or death of your children would not choose to, be, to die yourself, that your child may live. 
Despite what this world's agenda is to try to get women not to have any more children or to redefine what a mom really is, in our passage we find a real mom. She was not concerned about herself or her own well-being, but she was concerned about her son's well-being. I believe that in this late Laodicean church age that we are living in, we, uh, that, we, uh, that even so-called Christian parents are backslid, carnal, and lazy in their walk with God, I believe that it's time that we had some mamas who really did have some courage like Jochebed to do right, to stand for her children, no matter what the world has to say. I still thank God for what Bob Jones Sr. said when he said, do right. Even if the stars fall, yeah, Amen. Right. do yeah. right. Amen. In other words, no matter what happens, do right. Amen. Amen. And to a Christian that may not be good grammar, but it's real good doctrine, do right. Amen. Amen. Do right with your kids despite the plan that the world has for them. Take a stand for them, even if it'll cost you something. Amen. Right. She had courage. She had the right credentials. She had the right courage. Number three, notice this. Her confidence was right. Her credentials were right. Her, her, her courage was right. But then her confidence was right. Look at verse number 3 with me again. And when she could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein and she laid it in the flags by the river's brink. Look at verse number 6. Talking about Pharaoh's daughter here. And the maid and then Pharaoh's daughter later on. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? And we know the way the rest of the passage goes. Think about this. These verses tell us that Jochebed had to do one of the hardest things a parent would ever have to do, and that is to turn her child over into the hands of another. Think about that. There was a time in, the, in, verse, uh, in verse number three that she had to turn her child over into literally the providential hand of God. That's the confidence that I'm talking about. Right. When she said that it will either be disobedience, meaning my death, or obedience being Moses' death, she knew what had been declared. The verse uh, number uh, 16 said that the, uh, that the midwives had to destroy uh, the kids in chapter number 1. But then verse number 22, Pharaoh said that every son that was born that they had to cast into the river. We find later on in our passage that Jochebed was one of these Hebrew midwives. That was her occupation. That was the occupation of Moses' mother. And so therefore, when there was this child that was born, she was supposed to take it to the river and cast him in. But what we find, and I believe this is typical of moms as well, we find her using a little bit of creativity. Amen. Aren't you thankful for moms that are creative? Amen. Amen. I remember my mom and my grandma, I used to tell them all the time, I said, y'all can make a meal with nothing in the house. My grandma was amazing at that. I'd walk in and there would be nothing, I mean, hardly anything of worth to a child in, in a cat. Y'all know what I mean by that. Amen. Amen. Uh, anything worth for a meal for a child in the cabinet. But my grandma could come out and make something that was absolutely delicious with nothing in the house. I believe it's just ingrained in moms to be a creative people. Amen. Amen. And uh, with children, it takes creativity sometimes. Amen. We find her doing something a little bit creative. She knew that she could no longer have the child and that she was going to have to take him to the river one day or the next. So she took him to the river, but instead of casting him in, and by the way, that's what that word casting means. When the Bible says casting him uh, into the Nile River, it literally, it literally depicts throwing him in or hurling him in with the intent of causing him to drown. Jochebed said, I'm not going to do that. I'm this baby's mama. I cannot do that. My nature will not let me do that. So she finds a solution in verse number 3. When she could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark or a box is what that's speaking of there. Of bulrushes, uh, papyrus leaves, uh, of, that, of, that kind of, of that kind of material. 
as the Bible says, she daubed it with slime and with pitch. She fastened it together with those elements and put the child therein. She literally put him in a box made out of papyrus leaves that were absorbent and would be able to carry him along the brink of a river. And that is that is motherly creativity at its finest. Finding what she had on the brink of the on the brink of the river, putting something together that would save her child's life. What she's doing when she fastens and puts together that 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 box, that ark of bulrushes, what she's doing is, is she says that if he stays here and someone discovers him, then he, that then he and I both are going to be put to death. However, if I put him in this, yes, he still is in the Nile River. Yes, there still is danger, but I'm not throwing him and assuring his death. I am putting him in this, setting him in the water, sending him on his way, and trusting a very big God Amen. to take care of him. Not only was her credentials and her salvation right, and her courage was right, but her confidence was right. She had confidence in a God that could take care of her boy even when she no longer could. She was trusting Him in the hands of another. Mothers all over this country have found themselves having to do this for one reason or another. You find mothers that for one reason or another have to exchange, and all of these are heartbreaking processes. But turning their children over to an adoption agency, turning their children over to foster care, turning them over to other heartbreaking situations, there's other things that cause them to not be able to keep their children. And I just can imagine in my heart what it would have to be, for whatever reason, to turn your child over in the hands of somebody else that is not you. However, what we find Jochebed doing here, she is not turning her son over to an agency that is bound by law to try to find a family that will care for baby Moses. She is being forced to turn over her son to the uncontrollable rapids of the raging Nile River. This river was known for its many dangers. It was known in particular for the fierce creatures that called it their home. She was having to do this because if you can believe it or not, it was the best option she had. Can you imagine that being your best option? Will you be a mom that if you're faced with such devastating circumstances and the best option is a terrible option, are you going to trust God anyhow? Uh, you, you would think of a mom looking at a situation like this and saying this it's the best opportunity that I have to make sure my son's taken care of. This is the best option that I have. I can imagine a mom looking up to God and saying, God, how can you be here and this be my best option? Why would you have given me a child if this is what was going to be required of me? And looking up to God and, 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 and discharging disbelief in a God that they're supposed to be serving, but rather Jochebed did not lose faith, but she rather increased her faith. When the goal, when when the when the time of her when the time of her faith was at its most discouraged, she instead decided to trust God the more. When she said, there's nothing that I can do, she said, I know someone who can do something that I can't do. I'm going to do the best that I can with the opportunity that I have, and I'm going to have to take my hands off, and I'm going to have to let God do the rest. Amen. Think about this, her confidence. She had confidence to resist the world. We already saw that. Verse number 2 said that she stood against the powers that then were. We saw that how that in, show, in hiding their son they showed their confidence and faith that God could and would protect them and their son in the middle of a nation that wanted to do nothing more than to destroy their child. But not only did she have confidence to resist the world, and by the way every mom needs that confidence to resist the world. Confidence in God that will enable us to resist the world around us. But she also had confidence to release the child. Verse number 3 said she did that. It takes a, a strong faith in a God that's in control to take your child from your hands and put him in that river. Knowing what is in the river, knowing what awaits them. The Bible said for three long months she had 
uh, for three long months. She, uh, that must have felt like an eternity she had hidden her son. Every time that he had cried, she was cut deep with the fear that they would be discovered. Now he was getting too big, too loud for her to hide him any longer. And now she knew she had to release him. She had known for three months since the day of the birth of, her, of his birth that this day would come. She had spent the months looking into the face of her darling son. And the Bible says in chapter number 2 and verse number 2 that when she looked in his face, she saw that he was a goodly child. And that was the child she was going to have to let go. You know that word goodly there means it's the same word that we find in the New Testament, Hebrews chapter number 11 and verse number 23 where the Bible says that, he, that she saw or the parents saw that he was a proper child. The word goodly or the word proper means that he, uh, it means that he was beautiful, uh, handsome or comely. Acts chapter number 7 and verse number 20 when Stephen is preaching that great sermon uh, to those, those men and women there in Israel. He said in Acts chapter number 7 and verse number 20 he said that talking about Moses that Jochebed saw him as exceeding fair. She looked at her child and said this is an absolutely beautiful child. Is there any moms in here this evening that remembered the day that you just took time whenever it was, whether it was in the hospital or whether it came later. And I believe if I'm, if, if the case is the same as with my family, there's many times throughout the relationship between you and your children, you just looked down at them and said, what a beautiful life that God has given to us. Amen. What a beautiful child. I, I, I understand the way Jochebed felt because I look at my wife almost four or five, probably even more that times a week. I'll look at my son running around the room or laying down asleep or, you know, asleep in his car seat in our car or whatever's going on. I'll look, I'll look in the face of my son and I'll get the attention of my wife and say, isn't he beautiful? Amen. <laughs> and that's the word I used. I was amazed when I saw the, 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 the definition of this word was beautiful. It speaks of his beauty because I live there every day of my life. I look at that child that God gave me and said, man, Amen. that's a beautiful creature. Amen. What a beautiful baby. Amen. And I know it's because he looks like his mom. Amen. <laughs> Amen. But to her, this child was the most beautiful creature that God ever created. I believe every mom in here understands that feeling. Amen. How can a, a human being be that beautiful? It's almost so beautiful it has to hurt somehow. <laughs> How could somebody be that beautiful? She looked at him for three months and saw that beauty in his face, knowing there was going to have to be a day where she released that child, knowing how she was going to have to release that child into a situation she could not control, into a situation to where uh, it, is, it is very dangerous in that Nile River, knowing that was the best option they had. Can you imagine three months of waiting and knowing that's going to happen sometime. I can imagine the fear that came into Jochebed's heart the very moment that she realized that he's getting too big and he's getting too loud and it's going to be easy to discover him. And she knew that moment she had, that, that, that seemed like an eternity in the making, that scene, that moment that she had seemed to just dread and try to put off in her mind was now upon her and she had to move into action. She had faith. She had confidence in God that even caused her, even with all of that, to release the child. But how was she able to do that? How was she able to release him into the Nile and do what she did? It's because she knew that she was not releasing him to the crocodiles, releasing him to the snakes, releasing him to those raging waters, but she was releasing him from mama's hand into her father's hand. From her hand that kept him and secured him and the one that could secure him in a greater way than she could Amen. from her hand Amen. into God's hand. This assured her faith. This gave Jochebed the confidence. I believe when she saw that child, I read two commentators, Benson is one, then James and Foster Brown is another. They both suggested that they believe that this passage is teaching and Schofield even agreed with this in his reference Bible that they agreed that when they saw that he was a goodly child, they took that beauty as a sign from the Lord that God had a special purpose 
for this child. There's something different about this one. Their son, they saw, almost saw a glow of the touch of God upon his life. Amen. It's what many say they believe is implied here. And I, I, I don't have any proof scripturally uh, other than the, what this word means. I'm telling you, it feels right in my soul. Amen. Amen. God, and God did do something great with Moses. Yes, sir. But seeing that beauty gave her the faith to release him. Seeing that beauty gave, assured her that there was a God that was able to protect him, preserve him, and to prosper him. It gave her faith to resist the world, that confidence that she had. It gave, she had faith to release the child. But then number three, she had faith to raise the child. I believe in this passage of Scripture, we find one of the greatest graces of God. And I, I believe that when we read Exodus chapter number two, you really find God showing off. Look at this. Read with me please verse number 7. So up into this passage, up into Exodus 2, 7, she's given birth to the child. He's gotten too big to be hidden. She's made that ark of bulrushes and she's put him in the river bank. The Bible said the daughter of Pharaoh came. The very one that the, the, her daddy is the one that commanded this child to be killed. You want to talk about God showing off this lady comes just at the right time as he's put as he's been put in the water and she sees this baby and this baby that was too big and too loud to be hidden. What got Moses saying was the fact that he was too big and too loud not to be heard by Pharaoh's daughter. And the Bible said that she heard that cry. She opened that ark of bulrushes. She saw the child and behold the baby wept and it was something in that voice of that baby that would have just a little while before got him destroyed is now the reason for his salvation. Amen. The Bible said that God did a work in the daughter's heart of Pharaoh, who uh, Pharaoh's daughter, the daughter of Pharaoh, who made the decree for Moses to be killed. And now, as if God is literally just showing off, she sees the baby, and God puts a mother's love in her heart. To take care of that baby. To pull it out of certain destruction. And she knew. Look at verse number 6. At the end of the verse she declared. This is one of the Hebrews children. She knew which child it was. Obviously by looking at him and where the baby was. The Bible said this baby survived. She looked at the baby probably because of how beautiful he was and realized this, this, this child does not belong in Egypt, but it belongs to one of the Hebrews. This is one of the Hebrews' children. Pharaoh's daughter knew. She was disobeying her daddy's command. But she brought this baby home. Claimed it as one of her own. She made a laughing stock out of her dad. And the Bible says, read it with me. I can tell you about it, but let's read it together. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter. This is, uh, this, this, is, this is that sister that was mentioned earlier in the verse. Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew, Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. Amen. The one that God had saved and given the right credentials to to be a mama. The one that had the courage to stand against the world and to stand up for God and be counted as someone that lived for God. The one that had the, uh, had the confidence that she was able to resist the world, release the child, whatever it would mean, giving it its best hope of life. And now God had given her faith that she could now pass on in raising her child. Amen. Isn't it just like God Amen. for you to give up something for Him that means so much to you? Isn't it just like God for God to give it right back? Amen. Amen. God won't, I believe sometimes God calls us to let some things go just to be willing to see if He has control of us or our stuff has control of us. I believe sometimes God tells us to let some things go and just to see if it has a hold of us and God and once He sees we're willing to let it go for Him and let it go for His glory, He'll give it right back to us. Amen. All I wanted to see is if, if you really love this more than me. 
She realized, God realized that Jochebed loved him even more than she loved her children. And God gave her, by, by a mighty miracle of God, God gave her back her child and allowed her. The Bible said that the maid went and called the child's mother. And, and notice verse number 9. Pharaoh's daughter said, take this child away and nurse it for me. The Bible said that she was able to nurse her own child. And I love this. One of my favorite parts of the whole chapter. Amen. Pharaoh's daughter said, I will give thee thy wages. Amen. A task Amen. that if this child, if Pharaoh had not made a decree, she would have done just because she was the child's mama and had to do it for free. Isn't it just like God to pay you to do something, amen, that you would have already been doing anyway, but because you were willing to give it up for God and you were willing to, you were willing to give it to Him, He'll give it right back to you and give you more on top of it. Amen. 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 I say God will take care of His children. Amen. Moses needed his mama in the greatest, uh, the greatest danger of his life, and because she was willing, as a child of God, to have courage and stand when nobody else was standing, and have confidence in God, God gave it back to her. Amen. And allowed her to raise her baby. So I'll give thee thy wages. Verse 9 says, And the woman took the child and nursed it. Verse 10, And the child grew, and she brought him on the Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son, and she called his name Moses, and she said, Because I drew him out of the water. She had a problem with raising this child. She was forced to raise her child in Egypt. But the, pl the pleasure of raising this child was the fact that because God had given the child back to her, she may be in Egypt, a picture of, the, of sin and of the world, but she was able to raise her child for the Lord. Go with me to uh, Exodus chapter number 2 and look with me at verse number 11. You're probably already there. Exodus chapter number 2, verse number 11. Verse right down from where we concluded our reading. The Bible says, And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens. And he spied an Egyptian man smiting in Hebrew one of his brethren. And he looked this way and that way and when he saw that there was no man he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Now I know that's a very discouraging verse to read of that, that sin of Moses there but why would he have done that? Because he knew who he was. Why would he get upset for an Egyptian treating a Hebrew the wrong way. Because he knew he was not an Egyptian. He knew that he was of the he was of the Hebrews. He knew that he was a Jewish man. How did he learn that? He learned it because God gave him back to his mother. Amen. His mother was able to raise him and to nurse him Amen. and teach him where he came from. Amen. He taught she taught him that you do not belong to the Egyptians, Amen. but you belong to God. And there is a God in heaven. It's not, it's not the God of Ramses the Pharaoh. Right. It, is not, it is not the gods, the multiplicities of gods that they serve. But there is one God. And He's the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And He is who you belong to. She was able to give that to her child because she had placed confidence in God to preserve her child's life. Are you a mom that has great faith? If not, would you ask the Lord to give you that kind of faith? Lastly, this evening, let me give you the fourth thing. She had the right credentials. She had the right courage. She had the right confidence. And then I believe she got the right compensation. Look at what her child became. I would, the Bible says that her child, as we've mentioned before, became the lawgiver, became the deliverer of the children of Israel, became a great man from whom the book of Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation declares something that he contributed to the faith. I would imagine that while she knew her son was destined for greatness and even though she still, I believe that even despite that, she still stood in awe of exactly what God did with her son. With Moses being 80 years old when his ministry began, I sincerely doubt that she lived to see with her own eyes what God did with Moses. 
Many people believe that Hebrews chapter number 12 and verse number 1 is speaking of those who have gone on before being able to witness uh, from heaven what God is doing with the saints of God and cheering them on. I don't know where you stand with that passage, but Hebrews 12, 1, if that is the case, the Bible says, Wherefore, seeing we are also accomplished about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. If the opinions of those that believe that are true, it very well could be that Jochebed got to see what God did with her baby Moses after all. When he was when he was there and he accepted God's call in the burning bush, she very well may have been given privy, uh, a privy time to be able to witness her son accepting God's destiny upon his life. It very well could be when her son decided to stand before Pharaoh and said, God said, let my people go. She was able to see as Moses walked out of a, of a wicked Egypt with millions of Israelites, millions of Jochebed's people following behind her boy, her baby, her son, and to see God part those, those waters of the Red Sea and they walk across on dry ground. She could have seen her baby leading, leading those children. She could have seen her baby uh, meeting, meeting with God and hearing God and receiving God's law and receiving God's word and in turn giving it to the people and seeing what God God did with her son's life. I believe that we find here we can consider uh, we can consider Jochebed, we consider the kind of mother that Jochebed was. I believe we realize that she has risen as high as any other mother in the Bible with a single act of faith. I can imagine her eternal reward was great when she crossed over death's chilly Jordan and all of her sacrifice was worth it. Amen. Can you imagine her excitement when she got to see from the portals of glory how God was using her Moses? Think about that. We never know what God is doing in those around us. God has you here today in this world to influence someone and I believe He plans to reward you down the road. No one has a greater ministry or a greater opportunity to influence someone for God than a mother does with influencing her children. There's no greater opportunity Amen. than being a mother, than being a parent. So let me ask you this evening, what's your compensation for your acts, for your courage, for your faith? What's the compensation you're going to get when you cross over this chilly Jordan and you get to the portals of glory as a Christian? I believe that if you've done what Jochebed did, your reward will be great. I believe we ought to consider that as we raise our children, what kind of reward are we are we storing up for the labors that and I know you're not going to preach a great crusade as a mama. You're not going to see many people come to know the Lord as a message because you're not going to preach as a mama. But you don't have to preach to large crowds. You preach to an audience of one, an audience of two, an audience of three, an audience of five. However many children God has given you, you give them your faith. You show them your God. You instill that in them. They need you to do it. Okay. Moses needed his mama. And if a man like Moses needs his mom to be the kind of mom that she was, I can promise you, our children, despite their age, need, our, need moms and need parents that will model this great Bible character of faith and implement these things in our life. Amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Thank you for your patience.